Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on imposter syndrome and how to beat it with Mary Pryor, King's Council from the 36 Group. For those of you who haven't joined our webinars before, my name is Lucy and I'm an assistant consultant at DG Legal. I'll just go through a few bits of housekeeping before we begin. Um, so the slides from today's presentation will be sent over tomorrow and a recording of the webinar will be available indefinitely. So if we do run over and you do need to leave, you will be able to watch the rest at another time. We are in webinar mode, so we can't see or hear any of you. So please do use the Q&A or chat function um, to put your questions in so that Mary can address them at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> and uh, by way of a brief introduction to our speaker today, Mary is a criminal KC with a special expertise in questioning and representation of the most vulnerable members of society, with a particular focus on those on the autism spectrum, with ADHD and with personality disorders. Mary is often instructed in homicide, especially involving the death of a child or spouse, serious sexual offences, child sexual exploitation and organised crime groups involving firearms and drugs. Without further ado, I'll pass you over to Mary. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Imposter Syndrome and how to get over it. Now, in a minute, I'll tell you why you might think that I'm an important human being and why you'd be wrong about that. But before I do, let me tell you something that Jodie Foster said. She said this, I thought everybody would find out and they'd take the Oscar back. They'd come to my house, knocking on the door, saying, excuse me, we meant to give that to someone else. That was going to Meryl Streep. And just in case you think Meryl Streep would have had the confidence to accept the Oscar, as Jodie Foster suggested, a quote from Academy Award winning actress Meryl Streep is, why would anyone want to see me again in a movie? And I don't know how to act anyway. So why am I doing this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is the reason why we fail in life. Often, the reason that we fail is because of ourselves. It's not because of anyone else. It's not because of anything else. It is because we write our own history before we even leave our front door. Next slide, please. I am successful, yes. And what does success look like for a barrister? Well, I am a tier one legal 500 King's Council. They go from four, which is the lowest grade of the best in the legal 500, through to three, through to two, through to one. I'm a tier one. I am the chair of the Criminal Bar Association Rape and Serious Sexual Offences Group. I have the privilege of being a bencher at Gray's Inn and my practice consists of serious and complex crime. Over the last few years, I've conducted high profile trials, which are incredibly difficult. I'm a practitioner at the 36 Group, a blue chip set of chambers. And in 2022, I was awarded the prize of Woman of the Year 2022. Yes, that is what success looks like. Next slide. Imposter syndrome is a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist despite evident success. It's known as chronic self-doubt and feelings of intellectual fraud. Here you have two pictures, one of, of me on the day that I was made a Queen's Council, and the other is of the animal, 
that looked most closely like me wearing that wig. And why was that picture created? Because of course, I couldn't just revel in my success and enjoy it. I had to consider that I looked a bit of an idiot. Next slide, please. Now, one of the reasons that imposter syndrome is so damaging to both success and personal feelings of worth is because there is and has always been a contention within the legal profession that we are all in competition with each other. And the best way to look at that is to look around you, compare yourself with everyone else, and inevitably draw the conclusion that they're better than you and find yourself wanting. Your journey may be longer. It may involve some epic fails. Success may well cause people who you thought were your friends to demonstrate jealousy. And you will, as you succeed in life, generate people who hate your guts as a result because they take the view that your success holds a mirror to their failure. Your journey will include serious hard work, but it has nothing to do with luck. The first way that you can overcome imposter syndrome is to understand that your journey is unique. It is yours and yours alone. The fact that it took longer, that there were problems along the way, and that people sometimes have not helped you means that you are perfectly normal. It isn't luck. There is no luck involved in succeeding, but it is the word that we use again and again when we have achieved something. I'm so lucky. Well, let's just take a moment to look at the luck involved in qualifying as a practitioner. First of all, the luck that you require is to complete your GCSEs and your A-levels. That's years and years of hard work and self-discipline. To go to university, to take three or four years to do work week in, week out and succeed in your degree. To complete a postgraduate qualification, to obtain your training contract or your pupillage, to work through that and at the conclusion of it, to obtain employment. There isn't a little fairy that comes down from the sky and provides all of those things to you. Those things you have earned by yourself, week in, week out, day in, day out, hour in, hour out. And yet we always ascribe them to luck. Next slide, please. You must fight imposter syndrome because you matter. Permitting imposter syndrome to take over your head and your heart will stifle your potential for growth as an individual. It will prevent new opportunities for you personally and professionally. It will damage your relationships. It will damage you and it will remove a series of emotions that are contained within you. Why? Because you never ever have the opportunity of being with people who don't have to rescue you. If someone says to you, you look lovely in that, and your immediate reaction is, oh, this old thing, yes, I've had this for years, or no, I don't. Have you seen my fat chin, stomach, legs, bust, back, whatever? Then you are insulting the person paying you a compliment. And that means they are less likely to pay you one again. And then you will start wondering why people don't pay you compliments. And apart from anything else, you will never pay yourself one. 
you would never treat any other human being the way that you treat yourself. If your child said to you, look, look at this incredible drawing I've done, you wouldn't say to them, it's a mess, you're useless, even if this one's good, the next one would be bad. And why? Because you know that that would damage their self-worth considerably. Why, oh, why then do you do it to yourself? Next. In order to stop doing this, you have to begin by knowing your skills and knowing the things that you have to work on. Because what's vitally important to avoid imposter syndrome is to have a value, to have self-worth. So take two pieces of paper and on the first, write down all the things you know that you have skill in. Let's avoid the words good, strength, weakness, bad. All the things you know you have skills in. And on a second piece of paper, write the things that you've still got to work on. Do not describe them as weaknesses as opposed to strengths. No one can be good at everything although we have a society that suggests that we might. But write down those things that you have to work on and then work on those things. And in the process of that, be your own best friend. If you don't like yourself, why should anyone else like you? Once you understand who you are, what you are um, talented at and what you need to work on, work on being the best you that you can be. Don't look sideways, don't look up and don't look down. Just set about being the best you that you can be. And when you see poor behavior, either towards people or by yourself towards you or by others, call it out. If someone says to you, well, that's a bit rubbish, isn't it? Say to them, that's an inappropriate way for you to describe that. There may be these things that could be done differently. Let's work on those together. If you see someone in your workplace helping a person to continue to feel less than, support them and call it out. Your journey in law is a marathon, not a sprint. You may have a slower start, you may have a complicated path to getting there and you will see people who will succeed more quickly than you, but you may see them on their way down as you are going up. At every stage, when you reach the next step, stop and enjoy the view. Take a moment to think about what you have achieved to get where you have on your unique journey. Then set your next goal and promise yourself that you will work hard and diligently without stamping on anyone else or pulling up the drawbridge in order to achieve that next step. Constantly reevaluate your skills and the things you have to work on and take pride in what you do achieve in your unique position. Next slide, please. Amongst your group of friends, you will find individuals who you can see objectively support each other. Everyone in the legal profession needs a mentor, someone who is where they would like to be and who can help them in that process. At every level in my career, I've had a mentor. I still have one now, and I mentor a load of students and professionals. Why? It's a win-win. I learn from them, they learn from me. Surround yourself with a supportive group of friends who can inspire and educate you in the same way you can inspire and educate them. If you see anyone in your group 
treating a person badly, call it out. And if you see them doing it again, you will have to consider carefully whether that person should be a friend of yours. I can assure you that if they can do it to person A, they can do it to you. Take a good look at the people you let into your professional and personal life. And if they're toxic and they can't change, move them away. This is a photograph from Women in Criminal Law, a group of solicitors and barristers who come together to share experiences and education. It's been invaluable to me. Friends matter. Next page. This is a photograph of me at Sunday school. At Sunday school, I was poor. Poverty was part of my upbringing. I didn't have the lovely flowers that some of these little girls have on their head, nor did I have a nice pair of shoes or a new dress. When I looked at this photograph as a child, and as a young adult, I could clearly see why I stood out as being less than. That's bizarre, isn't it? Because if you look at this photograph, you might not be able to tell which one is me. If you want to see which one is me, you will see three quarters of the way along, there's a little girl who's got her leg out. That little girl was the most busy and popular girl in Sunday school. And you can see that because she is leaning forward to the camera. She knew her place in life. Down from her, you will see a boy, then a girl with flowers on her hair, two boys, and then me with my head tilted downwards, no flowers, a very simple dress. And if you can see it carefully, a pair of rather tatty shoes. Now, I just see that image as a group of young children. At the time, I saw myself as being a poverty girl. We all get labels in childhood. Which were you? Fat, clumsy, silly, plain, boring, stupid? In my case, I was Benefit Bennett. Children can be very cruel. But just because you're treated like that as a child does not mean you have to treat yourself like that as an adult. Quite the opposite. Next, please. This is an interesting bunch of four people, isn't it? Do they look any different than anyone else? Well, they're four high court judges. Imposter syndrome disproportionately affects high achieving people who find it difficult to accept their own accomplishments. Each one of them may look at this image and think, I wish I'd had my hand in a particular place. I don't like the way my suit looks. Look at my fat head. How am I here? Why have I managed to achieve what I have? And yet what you have here are four brilliantly talented judges who gave up to take part in the Midland Circuit first social mobility program event. Not only intelligent, but kind and caring. Next slide. Pauline Clance and Suzanne Innes developed the phenomenon now known as imposter syndrome in 1978. So what sort of person gets imposter syndrome? Well, Michelle Obama, she most certainly got it and still has it. Baroness Hale and Supreme Court Judge Sotomayor, she also has imposter syndrome. She said this, I've spent my years since Princeton while at law school and in my various professional jobs, not feeling completely a part of the worlds I inhabit. I'm always looking over my shoulder, wondering if I measure up. She's a Supreme Court judge. Baroness Hale, 
you know of her achievements. In her book, Spider Woman often describes times when she suffered from imposter syndrome. Next slide. But feeling unsure, feeling confused, a little worried, a little excited, should not make you feel like an imposter. You shouldn't be obliged to suffer from anything. And particularly, you shouldn't feel obliged to suffer from feeling like you are a fraud and thereby some form of luck. And more and more recent research is demonstrating that actually it may be the workplace that's the problem rather than you individually. Because in many institutions, in many firms, in many sets of chambers, still there is systematic racism, sexism and bias. Next, please. There's this thing, isn't there, where we're not meant to be too confident. We're not meant to be too hmm, full of ourselves, particularly as women. But then there's the other side of it where you see people who are supremely confident and a bit rubbish, actually. Being confident is not a sign of competence. And being confident does not necessarily make you a good leadership. People who fake it, apparently till they make it, can demonstrate confidence, false confidence, as arrogance and overconfidence. And arrogance and overconfidence are in fact inversely related to a leadership talent. A pet can become a threat. If they take you under their wing and like you, and then you start succeeding, they will view you as a threat to them. And if that is right, then that is another example of how imposter syndrome can be created by the workplace. There are many people who, when they succeed, batten down the hatches, draw up the drawbridge and make sure it's them alone that succeed. But that, I can assure you commercially, is no way to succeed. The best way we can conceive, or that we can succeed is to collaborate together, to have the confidence to share our ideas together without fear that they're going to be stolen or uh, taken by someone else and pretended uh, to be their own. Next slide. There are five basic types of imposter syndrome. There is the perfectionist. Oh my God, there is a mark on this document. There is a spelling mistake. I have forgotten to put the TH at the end of the 25th. I am a complete failure. It is, if you think about it, quite a useful skill to have attention to detail. But if that attention to detail leaks into perfectionism, you will constantly fail because no one can be perfect all the time. It simply isn't feasible or realistic. So if you find that you are a perfectionist, embrace and enjoy your attention to detail, but stop being so hard on yourself if you make an error. Remember that you are only human. The next type is the expert who thinks they want to know everything about their particular subject and works tirelessly and endlessly on and on so that they know everything, but no one can know everything. The law particularly changes every day. And even when you think you know a particular topic, it transpires there's something that you don't. It is a way of setting yourself up for failure. There is the one who describes themselves as a 
natural genius. They're not. They may have abilities, but those abilities will let them down because no one is a natural genius. People have to work. There's then the soloist who is so petrified of being exposed as someone who doesn't have as much knowledge as everyone thinks they have or as much ability or confidence as everyone thinks they have, that they keep themselves to themselves and work alone. But that isn't good for anyone because we all need to work together. Help is not weakness. And then there is the super person. And this is probably where I fall in to a type of imposter syndrome. This is the person who you admire so very much because this person works from four in the morning till midnight. They do anything and everything that you can imagine. Everywhere you turn, they're writing books or articles or running organizations. They work hardest longest they're most determined and what happens well they burn out or they make a major error and why are they working that hard because they do not feel that they are valued because they don't value themselves and as a result they obtain their value from demonstrating a commitment to be super person working the longest the hardest someone that everyone admires. Next, please. The common characteristics that you will demonstrate if you have imposter syndrome include an inability to assess your competence and skills. That's why the writing these things down matters so much. You will find it if you have imposter syndrome so much easier to write down the things that you're rubbish at than you will to find the things that you're good at. Because you will have spent a lifetime telling yourself about all the things you're rubbish at. And you may sit for a while thinking about the things that you might have skills in. Advocacy, negotiation, drafting, friendship, etc. But if you do take the time to do that, you will be able to assess your competence and your skills. And that will mean that you can move forward and away from the prison that you have created within your own head about the fact that you are a fraud. The other common characteristic is attributing your success to external factors. Thank you so much. I couldn't have done it without you. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't get here. All of which is nonsense. You may help someone, but the hard work, the diligence, the day-to-day -day stuff is done by the person themselves. Berating your performance. I was rubbish at that. Here are the things I did badly. Don't do that. If you're going to look at the things that you think you could improve on, you must also at the same time look at the things you did well. The overwhelming fear that you won't live up to expectations. You have instructed me to do X. You don't know me. I'm not really very good at anything. I don't think I'll be any good. And if I have to go to the next level court up, the Court of Appeal, the High Court, the Divisional Court, I will be there exposed as a fraud. Why? Because you have no self-confidence or self-worth. Because you haven't assessed your competence and skills. Because you don't know what you're good at and what you need to work on. The other common characteristic is overachieving doing more and more and more just to have some external validation. The next one is really important. It's something I talk to young lawyers and students about all the time, and it is sabotage. You sabotage your own success by not doing things. For example, I'm not going to apply for that job 
because I won't get it anyway. And I'm going to look an idiot. I'm not going to meet that person for drinks because they will see me as a fool and it will be awful and boring. I'm not going to that networking event because I'm fat and ugly and no one will talk to me and I might drink too much and, and, and. Sabotage is very toxic and it is the sort of thing that you have to take a good hard think about if that inner voice is saying any of those things to you. Go back to your pieces of paper with your competencies and your skills upon them and understand why you've been invited and learn to accept compliments, invitations and opportunities. Self-doubt is crippling. Oh, I don't think I'll be able to do that. I know if I go for that interview, I'm going to be rubbish. Oh my God, I'm no good. Don't do it. Don't listen to that inner voice. Accept the things that you have work to do on. Understand those and work on them to the best of your ability and self-doubt will go away. Or at least reduce. And setting unrealistic goals. In five years, I'm going to be thin, beautiful, have long nails, wear Laura Ashley clothing and sandals, have two perfect children, and I'm going to be married to a millionaire. Or I'm going to remain single. In five years, I'm going to be running my own company. I'm going to be in smart suits, and I'm going to be incredibly successful. Understand that success comes slowly and carefully with good foundations and a good build-up if you want it to last. Next slide, please. What's the impact of imposter syndrome? Well, if you're trying to look at it from a positive perspective, it will motivate you because you will believe that unless you work as hard as you possibly can, it will fail. Everything will fail. But you will be living your life almost in constant anxiety. Constant anxiety is exhausting and it causes the body to fight that constant anxiety by creating poor sleep, weight gain or severe weight loss, anxiousness, um, poor relationships, nail biting, neglect of yourself, neglect of your family, all manner of things. It means that you prepare your work again and again, and as a result, you're overworking. And if you add up your tiredness, your anxiety, your neglect of yourself, your inability to move and rest, it leads to depression. And when you reach that stage, it doesn't matter how well you do. Nothing will change your belief structure that actually this is just luck and you are a fraud. Next. Here are some examples of imposter syndrome so that you can better understand what it really looks like. You get promoted. Woo! Brilliant. Do you go out and drink champagne? Do you go for a lovely long walk with your family? No. You feel like a fraud. You sit in the corner and you fret about it. That is such a sad and painful thing when you have worked for so many years to be promoted. Again, it comes from failing to take the time to appreciate your skills and the things that you're less good at. Failing to promote yourself. Oh, I'm not going to put myself forward for that because that will be awful. And I will, oh, Lord, I'm just going to make a mess of it. And if you don't promote yourself and you don't know your own skills, you cannot ask anyone else to do that. You receive an award and you don't deserve it. And so you will put on social media, I am amazed and honored 
and shocked to receive this award. Why? Why? Thank you for this award, which reflects the work I do or the work I have done. Not, I never expected this. Why not? Why shouldn't you win an award? Why wouldn't you win an award, particularly when you bear in mind how hard you've worked to get there? And you dedicate the award to the people who have achieved the award for you. Your work colleagues, your partner, your friends, your parents, the person you believe in spiritually. You got that award. Other people have helped you within your profession, but you got yourself there. Deserve, own and value your success. And God forbid anybody pays you a compliment. You are so lovely. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Oh, it was nothing. Oh, I didn't. It, it's fine. No, no, no. It, it, it's all right. I, I don't say that. And no, I'm not all that good, actually. I'm, I, I muck this up. I'm a bit fat. I'm a bit ugly. I'm a bit old. If someone takes the trouble to compliment you, all you need to do is to say two words, just two, and they're magic words. Because what they do is they bring another compliment back to you from the same person and maybe from a different person. And again and again, people will compliment you. And here's the two words. Thank you. You look very pretty today. Thank you. I like your dress. Thank you. That was a really good piece of work. Thank you. Why is that so hard? Give it a go. Just say thank you. And what else do you do? Well, when you've made it, you just sit looking out of the window, waiting for someone to come and take it all away. You wait for the disaster to happen, which you know is going to happen because after all, you're not worth anything. If you sit and wait for a disaster, you never know, it might happen. You may write your own history. Enjoy what you have constantly, constantly reflect on your abilities, reflect on the things you still need to work on and focus entirely, not on comparing yourself with others, but on making sure that you are the best that you can be, bearing in mind your skills and abilities and your stage in your career. Next, please. If you're not sure whether you have imposter syndrome, ask yourself these questions. Do you agonize over small mistakes? You go over them again and again. Do you attribute your success to other people? If someone criticizes you or not necessarily criticizes you, but says, oh, I'm not sure that's the right piece of work. Are you highly sensitive to that? Do you ruminate on it for a very long time? Do you feel you'll be exposed one day as an imposter, as a fraud? And if people talk to you about your abilities and experience, do you downplay it? Those are all signs that you have imposter syndrome. Next. What are the causes of imposter syndrome? Well, it is a condition which affects everyone from all backgrounds, all ages, and all genders. Often it's rooted in family upbringing, parenting styles. You might go home with a piece of homework. You may have got 80%. The response you should get is, that's fantastic, well done. Well done for doing all of that hard work. Here is a treat for you. What you might get is what was wrong with the other 20%. And that will help you to develop imposter syndrome. You may be in a household where your parents say to you, uh, don't eat any more of that because you're already fat. They may put you on a diet. You may overhear them describing how even though you're ugly, you're actually not a bad person. 
those parenting styles can cause a lifetime of imposter syndrome unless you work on it. You may grow up in a house where there's a high level of conflict. That doesn't mean violence or abuse. It means tension where you can see that people aren't happy and you may well develop the idea that either that's your fault or you're making it work or that you're in the way. But what happens where there is a high level of conflict in a family is you get lost in that left behind and there's often little time for you to be valued. Going through a transition, massive changes in life, leaving home, divorce, ends of relationship, buying a house, starting a new job. All of those things, if not handled well, can cause imposter syndrome. And if it's a new job or a job at all, discrimination in the workplace can cause imposter syndrome. Saying things like, well, she's doing her best despite her limitations by an employer to an employee can cause imposter syndrome. Really, you know, you're not working hard enough can cause imposter syndrome. And also, if you have a poor friendship group or a poor partner who is not supportive, who are not loving, who are not looking at you as one of them, but you're in a group where everyone's comparing themselves with each other. And the minute one person leaves, they're all having a go at talking about the person who's gone so that you know that you are not properly supportive but you are still part of something can create imposter syndrome. Poor partners will cause severe imposter syndrome if you are not valued within a relationship. Next page. Coping with imposter syndrome and getting past it. Well, it's hard work, like starting running or starting a diet, and it isn't fixed overnight. It takes a long time, it takes discipline, but oh goodness me, it is worth it. This is far more important to your personal progress and well-being than any of the exterior things that we all fret about. So to get past it, start by asking yourself some really hard questions. What core beliefs do I actually hold about myself? What words would I use to describe myself? Clumsy, stupid, fat, ugly, lazy, dim. What words would you say about yourself? What do you think about yourself? Write it down. It won't wake, I imagine, for pleasant reading. Do you actually believe you're worthy of the love of anybody? Because at the moment, of course, you don't love yourself. And must you really be perfect for other people to love you? Is anyone you love perfect? Are any of your friends perfect? Are you far more willing to accept their errors than your own? Next page. So to move forward, use your friendship group and talk to other people about how you feel. Share it. They'll be astonished. If you don't share it, the irrational beliefs that you're focusing on will fester and fester and get worse and worse. If you see someone with imposter syndrome, and let's face it, if you've got it, you can spot it. Do try to help people. Help people who are like you, because in doing that, you will see how you should help yourself. Always stop and assess your own abilities again and again. Give yourself very small tasks, very small steps. 
take it slowly, one step at a time, in achievable blocks. And when you do achieve those things, your confidence will begin to grow. And do question your thoughts. How can I be a fraud? I've got a degree and a postgraduate qualification. And people like me. And I do these things well. How can I be a fraud? And the answer, of course, is that you are not. Next page. If you take nothing else from this webinar, please do take these absolute key principles. Do this if nothing else. Stop, 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 stop comparing yourself to others. It is the most pointless thing to do. If you look at someone else, you will see someone who you think is better than you for a variety of reasons. What you won't realise is that they will be looking back at you, seeing themselves as less than you. None of it helps anybody. The only person that you can be is you. You can't be the other person. That place is taken. So the only person you can be is yourself. Be the best you that you can. How can you do that? Well, stop using social media all the time, looking at pictures of perfect people with their perfect children and their perfect meals. It just makes you feel less than. It's taking up your time. It moves your emotions and psyche too quickly. It makes you anxious and irritable. Live in the world. Live in the real world. When you feel anxious, sad, miserable, frightened, listen to your feelings, accept and acknowledge them. Think about where they come from. And when you've done that, refuse to let those feelings hold you back. You have worked so hard to get where you are when so many people have not been able to achieve what you have. Don't let your inner voice hold you back. You deserve better. Next. You have not succeeded because you are lucky. Kylie Minogue should never be singing. I should be so lucky. Lucky, lucky, lucky. Why? Because luck is not why you succeeded. It never is. It isn't luck, it isn't fate, it isn't because you rubbed your magic gonk or whatever else it is when you walk along. You succeeded because you put the work in. Good advocacy, like luck, if you like, is 99% preparation and 1% inspiration. You have got where you are because you have earned it through week in, week out, day in, day out work. You are not lucky. Don't say you're lucky. If you win the lottery, you're lucky. If you get promoted at work, that is an achievement based on your skill set. Next. Here I am, successful. I am not perfect. Success does not require perfection. I am very proud of a few things in my life. And one is that on my journey upwards in my profession, I have been able to offer kindness and compassion to others as I have journeyed. You must do the same. This is a small world and you will meet people who are far, far more successful than you at various times. At other times, those same people may need your help. Treat everyone you meet kindly and compassionately and you will succeed. Learn to recognize that little inner voice that tells you that you are not really worth it, that you haven't done as well as you should do or you've done too well and whatever it is, you don't deserve it. And when you hear it, 
quieten it, shut it up, because it is toxic, it's dangerous, and it prevents you from being the best you that you can. Next page. Are we done? I think that might be the end. So just to wrap up, let me explain to you in simple terms why you need to move away from imposter syndrome. Having worked so hard, you need to be able to enjoy it. You need to be able to stop at the top of that mountain and look at the view and realize that you have got there through a combination of hard work, dedication, perseverance, and that you're going to enjoy your life. Otherwise, why be here? There is only really one reason to be alive, and that is to make the absolute best of it. When you do that, all that you can achieve becomes achievable. If a rather snotty-nosed, fat council house girl from Stoke-on-Trent who grew up in a house without books, um, who went to school with free school meals, a free school uniform, to the worst comprehensive school in the county with the highest crime rate, who went to a polytechnic and who then uh, couldn't afford to do anything else, so um, became a court clerk, um, then eventually was allowed to qualify uh, and actually only became a barrister because, let's face it, the solicitor's course was full, ends up being me. There is a demonstration to you that we are all capable of achieving everything that we want to if we put our minds to it and if we stop ourselves from letting ourselves prevent that success. Now, I'm just going to have a look at the chat. Goodness me, you've been busy while I've been chatting away. Um, well, these are very kind comments. Now, what am I going to do? I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to say thank you because I appreciate this compliment. I am glad that you find that this seminar is transferable to everyday life. Most certainly it is. If you find me an inspiration, that's amazing. I find everyone I meet is an inspiration. I don't think anyone's ordinary that I've ever met. Everyone is extraordinary. And I did go to a much worse comp than Liz Trust, Kate. Um, on my first day there, I uh, went to school at half past eight in the morning. And as I was going in, there was a, a young chap coming out with a used tampon that he was swinging. That was the first day there. The only good thing about that school was, for some reason, it was compulsory to do O-level Russian, which gave me an opportunity to study a language I wouldn't have done otherwise. I can tell you that the only thing I know about it, though, were those were the days in Russian. If I ever meet you, we'll have a little sing-along in that. Um, Beverly, you asked, does this phenomena predominantly affect any one gender, age and background? No, actually, not now. It used to be the woman's condition, but because of the changes in the world, it now is for everyone, any age and any gender. But Nina, how wonderful for you to be um, on this webinar. You are a woman I admire so much for all the work you're doing on the Northern Circuit to educate and inspire the next generation. And you say you have a friend who puts it clearly. It's very funny, you know, the better I work, the luckier I get. That is a fabulous, fabulous quote. Um, Shabana, thank you for saying that you will share this video with your son. I'm delighted to hear that. Um, Linda asked a question. How can you find a mentor in the legal uh, in profession? And is it important to have one? Yes, 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 it is. Um, you should be able to find one in your 
um, firm. If you can't find one in your firm, there are lots of organizations. Women High Up um, is one of them. The Inns of Court provide it. Um, your local law society will have a mentoring scheme. If not, reach out on LinkedIn or something to a, a wide variety of people. If you can't find anyone, get in touch with me and I will find someone um, with you. Um, and women in criminal law do have mentors, Kate, you are quite right, as do Bridging the Bar, Middle Temple, Gray's Inn, et cetera. All these places are just absolutely brilliant. Um, and Mamata, thank you so much for sharing this webinar with your daughters. If you follow the steps within this, you will be sharing far more than that with them. You will be sharing valuable lessons. Um, Beverly, you say you've been working on this for so long, uh, but you find it difficult to quieten the voice. I got um, a monkey, like um, a soft toy monkey. And if I find myself having a voice that just makes me go, eh, you're rubbish, I just get hold of my monkey and don't tell anyone about this, but I give it a slap across the face. Uh, and I will say to my toy monkey, stop yourself. Um, I used to, for many years, um, have on my desk in chambers an Elmo, um, you know, from Sesame Street, uh, just to remind me not to take life too seriously. But um, when I got busier and busier in my practice, I did need something to slap. Um, it's much easier to slap a toy than yourself. So um, that's also worth a try. Or you can just knock something over. Um, whatever suits you but when you hear <laughs> yeah you get onto Amazon Beverly that's great um, when you hear that um, stop yourself and do something about it and Pearl I understand that this will remain on the DG Legal um, website for some time and I think they then put it on YouTube um, Matthew, you said that a little self-doubt encourages you to strive to do more in everyday setting. Can I ask you to just consider, instead of calling it self-doubt, consider what I said about the fact that you can have a list of things that you've still got to work on. That's a much more productive and supportive way of dealing with um, improving in life. You don't need to doubt yourself. You just need to realize that there's still a stage to go. Um, and Lena, um, we all uh, practice and say, um, goodness me, I'll be found out. Those of us with imposter syndrome always feel that way. If you want to practice, give it a go. Find a mentor, speak to someone, speak to your local law society and see what they can do to help you. It's never too late. The beauty of this job, the law job for women, is that the older you get, the more valued you are. There aren't many jobs like that for women. You don't get knocked off the um, top of the ladder when you get to 35. There is always a time to start. My beautiful eldest sister, who was a nurse, um, went to university at 40 and did a law degree. And then she worked in the local authority in Essex in housing law. Um, she is a heroine of mine. I think anyone who goes late in life is a heroine. Um, it's just silly. Um, Justina, don't be embarrassed to say that you're a qualified solicitor. Be proud own your achievements that's hours and hours of work and I think that apart from saying thank you to everyone who's been kind enough to write something that is I think the end of our session Lucy thank you so much Mary um personally one of my favorite webinars that um I've watched so thank you very much I'm sure that's on behalf of all of our delegates today as well um, so yeah, brilliant. And just a reminder to everyone watching, the slides will be sent over to you tomorrow um, and a recording of the webinar, as Mary said, will be available on our website and also on YouTube. 
Um, this afternoon, you should all receive an email asking to rate this webinar out of five stars. So if you have enjoyed, please do leave some feedback. Um, it's most welcome. And any suggestions for future topics are also very welcome. Uh, just to finish off then, our series of webinars continues on the 21st of September, when we will be presenting on human trafficking and modern slavery, an overview of best practice for legal aid, immigration and public law practitioners. And that will be with Lindsay Kundal from the Anti-Trafficking and Labour Exploitation Unit. So yes, thank you very much again, Mary, and thank you everyone for watching. Have a lovely afternoon and take care. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.